respected Dharma Masters, fellow practitioners, and guests. In the last talk, we had started to learn of what Mr. Liao Fan had written on the proper teachings from the book. What is meant by protecting the proper teachings? For millions of years, proper teachings have been a standard of truth and provided spiritual guidance for all living beings. Without proper teachings, how can we participate in and support the nurturing of heaven and earth? Without proper teachings, how can we help people to attain achievement? How can beings in all the realms succeed in their endeavors without a standard to live by? How can we be free of the five desires, the six dusts, our delusions, our afflictions? Without proper teachings, how can we set a standard in the world and help people transcend the six realms?" End quote. Proper teachings are the personal achievement of wise sages, which have been proven by using the standards of truth and wisdom, such as those found in the great teachings of Confucius and Buddha Shakyamuni. The four books are comprised of the thoughts of Confucius and Mencius, and are the essence of Chinese culture. Confucius and Mencius lived 2,500 years ago. Their guidance benefited individuals, families, society, the entire country. As the four books have been introduced abroad, people in other countries have expressed their agreement after learning what they teach. This is why the teachings of Confucius, Mencius, Lao Tzu, and Zhuang Tzu are said to surpass the dimensions of time and space and are genuine sutras and teachings. And among all the Buddhist sutras, the Infinite Life Sutra is unsurpassed. The essence of traditional Chinese culture is contained within the four books, and thus the merit of scholar Shiju, who wrote the commentary, is inconceivable. The content of the four books is very similar to that of the Flower Adornment Sutra, which provides principles, methods, and behavior for us to emulate. Of the four books, Doctrine of the Mean provides the principles, Great Learning provides the methods, Analects and Mencius tell of the lives of Confucius and Mencius. In other words, they teach how to apply the principles and methods in our daily interaction with others, matters, and objects. Thus, the Analects and Mencius are just like the 53 visits of Sudana in the Flower Adornment Sutra. The four books and the Flower Adornment Sutra even have the exact same structure. To guide the world is to set a standard, to be a role model. Regarding transcending this world, actually, there are no boundaries between this world and the world beyond. 
The difference between them lies in whether we are deluded or awakened. When awakened, we transcend this cycle. But with one thought of delusion, we are again back in this world. With another thought of awakening, we again transcend. From the book. Therefore, whenever we see way places, memorials of past virtuous people or sages, pictures of sages, or Buddhist texts, we should be respectful. If they are in need of repair, we should repair and put them back into order. End quote. The teachings of the sages have a direct bearing on individuals' minds within society, on trends in cultural behavior, societal happiness and peace, and the overall well-being of the group. Since ancient times, the wise and virtuous have been analogizing the teachings of the sages as the sight of heaven and earth. How do we protect and uphold them? Way places are institutions of Buddhist education. Schools are institutions of worldly education. Both need to be protected and sustained. Today's schools have largely abandoned the education of morality and ethics, which is why we have such suffering and misery. I say largely because there are some exceptions. Earlier this week, we attended the opening ceremony for the Jamia Education Center. They did not go into extensive detail during their opening remarks about how many computers they had or how much more equipment they were planning on buying. They explained how they wanted to prepare people to have good working skills and how they wanted their students to have a good moral foundation. They wanted them to have proper values. They have already succeeded in doing so. We could see in the faces of the children and all the people who were there, the qualities of sincerity, respect, and loving kindness. We were not the only ones to value the good work they are doing. Almost a dozen countries were also represented because they had joined in supporting an educational endeavor that was also providing the proper teachings. Ancient Chinese sages were knowledgeable about science and technology, yet they chose not to continue development of this technology. Why? They foresaw that in the end, technology would destroy our world. So they chose instead to concentrate on the humanities, to help people develop wisdom, to understand and practice morality and ethics, to help people understand the relationship among people between humans and spirits and between humans and nature to become a person who is fearless and indomitable. 
Only in this way will individuals experience true happiness and well-being and will countries and citizens be able to have a real future. This is genuine education. In the early 1900s, the Chinese government abandoned classic Chinese education. At the time, many wise and virtuous people felt deep sadness over this decision. The bad seeds that were planted then are now bearing fruit. If ever we have tasted the bad fruits, if after we have tasted the bad fruits and we are still not awakened, then we are lost. This way of thinking can destroy countries and races. The result of abolishing Chinese classic education is the destruction of the proper teachings. And if Confucian and Taoist teachings cannot be protected, then Mahayana Buddhism cannot be established. Buddhism has flourished for 2,000 years in China because it was based on the foundation of Confucianism and Taoism. But today, we are digging away the roots, destroying the foundation. If this continues, the teachings of the Buddha will become mere empty words. In the past, books were not privately owned, so writing in them was not allowed. They were carefully passed down from generation to generation so others could also read them. Those who wished an individual copy would hand copy one for their personal use. They were cherished, respected, and protected. If any of these ancient texts were damaged, then individuals would mend, copy, and distribute them so it would not be lost. This is the greatest merit from the book. We can propagate and carry forward the proper teachings and help others to learn their value. In this way, we can repay our gratitude to the Buddha. We should especially do our best and encourage others to do so as well." End quote. This teaches us that we need to help propagate the teachings of Confucius and the Buddha and to encourage others to do so as well, to help benefit all others. In so doing, we will truly be repaying our gratitude to the Buddha. To be able to do this, we need to accomplish two things. First, we need to help train Dharma repositories who can properly propagate the teachings. Second, we need to establish way places where the teachings can be taught, thus enabling people to have a good educational environment for both learning and practicing. Today, Few people are propagating the Dharma. So instead of relying on others, we need to rely on ourselves to do this. We establish a way place 
in the hope of providing the opportunity for more people to encounter and learn Buddhism. Today, the best way to do this is through TV and the internet, which can bring Buddhism into almost every family's home. We could invite benevolent teachers to choose the sutras that would benefit society the most and to have them take turns lecturing. Since Mahayana Buddhism is built on the foundation of Confucianism and Taoism, we could lecture first on the four books. Next, we could lecture on Mahayana Buddhism. In this way, people would be able to thoroughly absorb and digest the teachings, thus preventing them from becoming mere empty words. So if we truly wish to help Buddhism flourish, we would do well to begin with traditional, classic education, such as the teachings of Confucius. To do this, we can begin by nurturing Dharma repositories and establishing way places. Establishing a way place does not mean spending a large amount of money on a building that will result in endless squabbles and conflicts. When this happens, the effort and expenditure will become meaningless. We need to understand that once we start learning and practicing Buddhism and attain wisdom, we will realize that wealth is like a puff of smoke, a fleeting cloud. No matter how much wealth we have, it is only something to look at. Think about it. Is the money we keep in our home really ours? If it were truly ours, then we would keep it instead of giving it away to another. And yet, when we receive money, we pass it on to another. It was ours for a very short time. Thus, we should not place much importance on wealth. A fellow Buddhist who had immigrated abroad told Venerable Master Jing Kong, my teacher, that after he made a million dollars in the stock market, he immediately lost it again. Teacher asked him why he did not listen to Liao Fan. When we lose something, it means that we were not supposed to have it. So there is no need to worry. We should neither be happy when we gain something, nor unhappy when we lose it. To do so would be a sad waste of time. Those who understand and possess wisdom would instead use their precious time to chant a Buddha's name. We need to understand the principles. If we are diligent in our practice and propagate the teachings to help all others, we will gain infinite merit. Then all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will praise us from the book. 
What is meant by respecting our elders? It is making an extra effort in being attentive to and respecting parents, elder siblings, leaders, superiors, elders, or those of high virtue, prestige, and learning. When taking care of parents at home, we are to do so with loving hearts and a gentle, accommodating appearance. We should not raise our voice, but maintain a peaceful bearing. As we cultivate these virtues, they will become a part of us, and we will change into a gentle-hearted person. This is the way we can touch the hearts of heaven." End quote. In ancient China, those who taught young children placed great importance on basic education. They taught filial piety, respect, and sincerity, which are the outlines, the foundation of the teachings. Thus, the character nurtured in our childhood will become our nature when we are grown. This provides the foundation for the nurturing of sages and virtuous people, which will provide for a moral society and a wisely managed country. Since ancient times, this has been the Chinese tradition. The Chinese say that education is most essential to establish a new government, train its leaders, and govern its people. If the basic quality of education is not clearly recognized, incorrect viewpoints and thinking are enough to destroy the entire culture, country, and even its very people. All the government officials in ancient China studied the works of wise sages and virtuous people. Even if some had selfish intentions, there were still some limits and rules. They would only exceed so much. Doing so probably resulted in feelings of regret. Nowadays, sexual misconduct, criminal acts, wrongdoings are all viewed as matter of fact. We no longer have a shameful heart, no longer feel remorse. We have lost our sense of morality and ethics. We have lost our very conscience. And this is deeply troubling because all that separates us from other animals is our good heart. Hopefully, fellow Buddhists will realize that sincerity and respect are the gateway to and the foundation for practicing Buddhism. Sincerity and respect are cultivated within our family. At home, we are filial to our parents and respectful of elders and siblings. Accomplishing this 
will enable us to be in accordance with superiors, to be diligent and dependable in meeting responsibilities as individuals, members of society, and citizens of our country. As Mr. Liao Fan said, habits become one's nature. Once a good habit is formed, then we will be gentle, and this will touch the heart of heaven. When we are peaceful, kind, and agreeable, we will be able to move the beings and spirits of heaven and earth. Today, we have forgotten the ethical teachings of the human relationships. We are no longer moral. Instead, most people are mired in thoughts of greed, anger, ignorance, arrogance, and doubt. Malevolent spirits, beings, and demons have descended. Why? Our proper thinking, our improper thinking, has formed a connection with them. Buddhas and bodhisattvas will not come. Humans were already committing wrongdoings, but now there are malevolent spirits and demons creating chaos as well. This is why our world will have increasing disasters in frequency and severity. When this happens, there may be many deaths. Only when we personally experience these grave occurrences will we be awakened from delusion and improper viewpoints, regret our wrongdoings, and turn back to the proper path. It is truly regrettable that small disasters cannot accomplish this. It will take a major disaster to awaken us. This is unavoidable. We need to study history and view the chaos in the world from a historian's point of view to realize the source of good occurrences as well as of disasters. This will enable us to detect the law of cause and effect. What are people thinking today? What are they doing? Knowing this, we will know the future. The results that we are currently seeing come from causes created decades ago. The results of the causes that we are currently creating over and over will be seen in only two to three decades. Previously, the seeds that were planted might have taken seven to eight decades to mature. But today, the increase of these bad causes is resulting in a shortening of the maturity period and in greater magnitude. This is terrifying. Good causes will always result in good results, and bad causes will always result in bad effects. The principle of cause and effect 
is correct, is unchangeable from the book. When carrying out deeds for our superiors or the government, we should follow the rules and not become unrestrained just because our superiors do not know what we are doing. Before we convict someone of a crime, regardless of whether the crime is serious or not, we should investigate carefully and handle the case justly because our superior does not know what we are doing. When we face our superior, we should show him the same respect as if we were facing the heavens. As the motto says, this is the correct behavior handed down from our ancestors. It has a direct and important effect on our hidden virtues. Look at all the families who practiced loyalty and filial piety. Their descendants prospered for a long time and had bright futures. Therefore, we can follow their examples and practice with caution." End quote. If someone cultivates the virtues of loyalty and filial piety, then they will also have descendants to last for a long time. But today, parents and children are more like friends, and this is destroying the moral principles. Confucianism and Taoism teach us that moral principles and ethics are the nature of virtue. Closer examination of Buddhism shows that it is the revelation of our virtuous nature. Sages and virtuous people do not experience selfishness, so they have revealed their virtuous nature. Confucianism is the revelation of our virtuous self-nature. When this self-nature is revealed, it will be the same as that of Confucius. It is the same as light. When his lights up, mine does as well. Our light intermingling with another to become one is the revelation of self-nature. This is the true greatness, is truly inconceivable, is the perfect and virtuous self-nature. Filial piety and respect are the tools we use to reveal, to uncover our original self-nature to become enlightened. In Buddhism, it is said that the most important requirement to uncovering our self-nature is to generate the Bodhi mind. The same is true for Confucianism, which also teaches us to practice the sincere and virtuous mind. We would do well to interact with others, matters, and objects with filial piety, 
respect, and sincerity. To do so without deceiving others or ourselves. To do things quietly by ourselves is the true way of doing good deeds and accumulating merits. It is said it has a direct and important effect on our hidden virtue. Cause and effect can be witnessed throughout history and up until today. It is the truth, not falsehood. Therefore, when we give rise to a thought or perform a deed, do not think that no one will know. Other people may not know, but all the beings and spirits of heaven and earth, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will know. Mr. Liao Fan told us earlier to reform and correct our faults. We need the shameful heart, the fearful heart, the courageous, determined heart. To become a sage, a virtuous person, a bodhisattva, a Buddha, we simply need to truly and to completely generate these three hearts to realize our goals in this lifetime from the book. What is meant by loving and cherishing all living beings? A heart of compassion is what makes a person. A person in search of the virtues of mercy and kindness looks out for his or her heart of compassion. A person who wants to accumulate merits also cultivates a compassionate heart." End quote. A heart of compassion is the heart that is kind and loving to all beings and matters. When we see animals suffering, we naturally feel sympathy for them. Do we all have this heart? Yes, all of us do. If we shed tears while watching a sad movie or a show on television, this is the heart of compassion. We possess this heart even when we know the tragedies on television and in the movies are not real. So it is understood that when we see real people and animals suffering, that we would try to help them. Not only Human beings have the heart of compassion. Animals also do. This is truly the virtuous nature, our original self-nature. The original nature of animals is no different from that of we humans. But because they are even more deeply deluded than we are, they have become animals. All the beings in the ten Dharma realms share the same self-nature. This is why the Buddha in the Mahayana Sutras spoke of unconditional, great compassion 
and the kindness of realizing that we are all one entity. The heart of compassion is the heart of great caring and loving kindness. They both are revealed from our true nature. This is what a person in search of the virtues of compassion and loving kindness is seeking. It is also what a person wanting to accumulate virtues is seeking. It is wanting to broaden the heart, to care and love all others, to truly be able to love all beings and objects. We do our best to help them from the book. It is stated in the Book of Rites from the Zhou Dynasty. In January, when most animals bear their young, females of the species are not to be used for sacrificial purposes. End quote. In the past, three animals, cows, sheep, and pigs, were used in major sacrificial offerings. Most other ceremonies would use just pigs. They did not use females for offerings that were made in the spring, because if the female was pregnant, that would have been killing two lives from the text. Mencius once said, an honorable person will not go near the kitchen. This is to protect a compassionate heart. End quote. The purpose of Mencius saying this is the same as that of the Buddha teaching of the three pure meats. We only eat animals when we did not see the actual killing, hear the actual killing, or have the animal killed for ourselves. It was the custom in India to go from house to house accepting food offerings. So, whatever was offered was eaten. No discrimination, no attachments, no choices. This is true compassion. According with conditions and not seeking affinities. Simply accept and eat whatever people offer. This tradition is still carried on in countries where Theravada Buddhism is practiced. For example, in Thailand and Sri Lanka. When Buddhism was transmitted into China. At the time, it was considered the most advanced and civilized country in the world regarding codes of behavior. Now, there are few codes of behavior left. When the Dharma masters were invited to China, the Chinese government disapproved of begging so it would have been inappropriate to tell the masters to go out and beg for their food. So they were instead offered food in the palaces. The practice 
of going out to ask for food really never took hold in China. However, the three pure meats rule was always observed when offering food to the Dharma masters. Emperor Liang Wu initially advocated vegetarianism for Buddhists. Throughout the Buddhist world, only Chinese practitioners, whether monks, nuns, or lay people, are vegetarians. So people need to know that the tradition of Buddhism is to practice the three pure meat rule, not vegetarianism. The Chinese initially advocated vegetarianism. It is sanitary, protects nature, and protects the compassionate heart. It is the practice of loving kindness for all beings. When we understand that it is also the best and the healthiest food, we will see that it is worth our while to advocate its practice. Mencius taught that it was not good to go near the kitchen so one would not see or hear the killing. Then the individual would be more at ease when eating. But actually, the mind, the heart of compassion, could still not be at ease. So it is best not to eat the flesh of another living being. Especially today, when we hear so often of meat that contains toxins, causing people to contract strange diseases. Where do these diseases come from? From the consumption of meat. Ancient people said illness enters from the mouth. Teachers, late teacher, Mr. Bingnan Lee, often sighed as he said that modern people were taking poison at three meals. How could we not get sick? From the book. Therefore, our ancestors did not eat meat under four circumstances. First was if they heard the killing. Second was if they saw the killing. Third was if they had raised the animal themselves. And fourth was if they had the animal killed for their consumption. Even if we cannot stop eating meat immediately, we can still try to start by following these four guidelines. In this way, we are gradually increasing our compassion. We would not only refrain from killing any living creatures, but insects as well, for they are also living creatures. Man makes silk from the cocoons of silkworms. The cocoons have to be boiled in water first with the silkworms inside. When we cultivate the land for farming, how many insects have to be killed? We need to be aware of the cost in lives 
involved in our everyday food and clothing. We kill to provide for ourselves. Therefore, to waste food and clothing would create the same violation as killing." End quote. This speaks of the three pure meats with an additional rule that monks and nuns may not raise animals. Raising animals and then killing them is truly unacceptable. Practitioners who are unable to become vegetarian can practice the three pure meats rule and the four circumstantial meats rule to cultivate great compassionate hearts. Our lifespan in this life is very short, only a few decades long. Yet, in order to nurture ourselves, we kill others. We are steeped in debt to all living beings, regardless of whether we harmed them intentionally or unintentionally. Just imagine how much bad karma we ourselves have committed. This is why the Buddha said, if bad karma had shape and volume, then even the entire universe could not contain it. We have an inconceivable amount of karmic debt, of karmic obstacles. Only when we realize this will we become more alert and cautious. How can we be responsible for all living beings between heaven and earth? We obviously need to strictly abide by the rule of not killing. But also, we need to be careful in our daily living, drinking, and eating, and not waste anything. Modern people advocate consumption by saying that if people did not spend money, then the factories would be closed down and the economy would collapse. Do you believe that this is correct? If Master Zhang Feng had heard this, he would say, not necessarily. Actually, this is very incorrect. Many countries promote consumption and thus waste, yet their economies are still declining. Only by being thrifty will people, a country, become rich, prosperous, and peaceful. If there are no habits of saving, how can the country become prosperous and strong? How can the citizens have stable lives? If we have no savings, then when we are out of a job, we will have to depend on the country for financial aid, and this will increase the financial problems of the country. If, however, we have the habit of saving, then even if we become unemployed or suffer adversity, we could still live independently and not depend on the country. 
we need to be aware of this and value our resources and powers. From the book. How often have we unknowingly harmed or stepped on a living creature? We should do our best to prevent this from happening again. An ancient great poet once wrote, In love of the mice, we often leave them some rice. In pitying the moth, we will not light the lamp. What a kind and compassionate statement. End quote. The above words are for our understanding, for modern society would strongly disagree with them. How can we love? Mice. Mice are harmful to human beings. Consequently, they are often exterminated. People do not understand about the six realms of reincarnation. When we kill mice, they will seek revenge. This cycle of revenge will continue growing worse each time. Does killing them really solve anything? Are there not any other solutions to the problems? There is no such thing as walking away scot-free from my murder. No such thing as not paying our debts. By truly understanding the reality that the law of cause and effect connects the past, present, and future, we would not do anything bad. For if we do, it will come back to us. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Once we understand this principle, then we would never again harm any living beings, never again make an enemy of them, never again owe debts to anyone. This is how our minds will be at peace in this lifetime. 